Hey guys, so it's been a very long time since I did one of these videos. I'm sorry about that. It's just, you know, I've been busy and I don't think we really need one for a while. Now we do though. Uh, what I'm going to be giving you today is something that's going to take you at least four days. And I, I don't think it'll take you four days to work on it, but I'm giving you four days to work on it. Uh, there's four different parts. Uh, so if you want to break it down day by day, if you want to do it all at once, whatever you want, uh, it's up to you. So uh, we're going to kind of go over how Thomas Jefferson gets, uh, Thomas Jefferson gets elected how uh, that whole process happens and the awkwardness that happens afterwards, along with uh, one of Thomas Jefferson's biggest accomplishments as president. So we'll, we'll uh, look at that, and we'll kind of get ourselves uh, a little bit more familiar with the, the man who uh, wrote the Declaration of Independence. So uh, you have four things to do. I'd like you to first watch a song from the play Hamilton, uh, then explain some details in the song. That's right here. Uh, it's five questions. Next up is um, what, what I'm going to look at right now. Uh, we're, like that's why I want you to do second. Uh, there are seven questions about what I'm just going to talk about in a moment. Afterwards, there is a reading quest uh, on here as well, uh, all in blue. Uh, that shouldn't take you too long. It's just kind of giving you some outlines about something called the Louisiana Purchase. You've probably heard about that before. And last but not least is um, the exploration of the purchase itself, and that's what I'm going to talk about too. So um, I'm talking about one, in, or I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking about two and four in this video. One and three are on your own. So it's, it's up to you. Make sure you do one and three by yourself because that's on this doc. But two and four I'm going to talk on about right now. I want you to do number two, then answer the questions for the Louisiana Purchase, then come back and finish this video. So that's what I'm saying. Is you have four days because I'm going to make you jump back and forth a little bit. But I'm not too worried about it. I think you guys will be fine with it. Uh, so uh, after Thomas Jefferson started to step down, uh, I think it's, I'm not sorry, not Thomas Jefferson, John Adams started to step down. I think it's pretty clear that uh, the, the country needed change. Uh, and just to kind of talk about Thomas Jefferson really quickly, uh, some of his beliefs kind of aligns a lot with Republicans today. Uh, he believed the government which governs least governs best. He argues that the state should have the most uh, rights over the national government. Uh, he believes the Constitution should be very clear and strict, and you can't argue it like we do today when we say, oh, it's a living document that doesn't have any specifics. Thomas Jefferson believes that the, the, the Constitution should be very strictly looked at. Like we, we, The freedom of speech can only cover that, just speech, not other th items such as that. Uh, and then the last one, which is wild, this is uh, he wants to end all taxes of any kind paid by U.S. citizens. Uh, that's something that to this day, no, 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 neither Republicans nor Democrats would think that to do. Uh, but he believed if we got rid of taxes, it could spur the economy stronger. That's just his belief, though. So, uh, election of 1800, there are two people running for uh, the position in Democratic Republicans. We have Thomas Jefferson, you know well, and a man named Aaron Burr. Uh, Aaron Burr, we kind of talked about a little bit. Uh, he is a colonel from the Revolutionary War. Uh, he's now a, quite a rich man in New York City. Uh, he's pretty well liked in the city itself. He just doesn't really have much experience when it comes to politics. Then you have Thomas Jefferson, who's been in politics for a very long time. He's a fantastic writer, but he's kind of an awkward, weird guy. He's not a great speaker. Uh, he honestly has some weird mannerisms that people don't kind of like about him. Uh, also, a big thing that people don't like about him is they call him a Francophile. Uh, they argue that he uh, likes France more than England. Or, I'm sorry, more than America. Um, and that's partly true. He really liked the, uh, going to France. He lived there for quite a long time, and he felt that France's equalities uh, were something that America should look up to. On the other side, we have two other people that I, you don't have to concern yourself with too much. We have John Adams and Charles Pickney. Adams was uh, the president for the last four years. Not very popular, unfortunately. Uh, he tried his best. I'm not saying he did bad. He just The things that he did weren't very popular. Uh, Charles Pickney, he was, he was just a, a colonel in the Revolutionary War as well. Someone that's not really a, a factor in this election, though. Um, and it's because of uh, our friend Alexander Hamilton. Uh, he was one that kind of split the federal, Federalists when it came to who, who they should vote for. He had a lot of sway in the Congress at this point. And uh, with his uh, confusion, or I guess lack of foresight, uh, he didn't really give the Federalists... Uh, like direction, and because of that, the Federalists kind of split their votes, and it ended up being a runaway with the de for the Democratic Republicans. Uh, both Jefferson and Burr won the election. They tied. They actually got the same amount of electoral votes. The uh, process of electing the president back then was much different. It was more of a, a okay, who are the top two people you'd want to vote for? 
And it's not more who do you want to be president and vice president, it's more who do you think is the two best people. And the founding fathers assumed that there would never be a tie. Well, they were wrong. Uh, the third election, they had a tie. Um, and it came down to, I'm sorry, well, first of all, they, they had to get rid of this. They fixed this as fast as possible. Uh, the 12th Amendment was uh, what fixed this mess. They pretty much would, uh, changed it to the, the idea that there is now a president and there's a vice president. Uh, everyone assumed Aaron Burr would be the vice president, but there was never any confirmation. And Burr kind of said, hey, I tied. Why can't I be president? I don't think it's fair. Jefferson should be president. So, uh, what, and you can see the map right here as well. Um, it's, it's kind of a weird one uh, that they tied. Uh, you can actually see, like, uh, funny enough, that uh, Aaron Burr, who's from New York, didn't even get New York, uh, which is interesting. But it all kind of, kind of come down to the delegates more than anything else, not the people. Uh, so the election was settled in the House of Representatives. It took them 35 different votes. And as you hopefully saw at, at this point from the music video for Hamilton, you saw that... Uh, it was swayed because of Hamilton's remarks. Uh, I mean, I love that the quote at the end. He said, ha uh, Jefferson has beliefs, Burr has none. Hamilton really didn't like Jefferson at all, but the fact was that he respected Jefferson, and Burr, he didn't really feel like would be the influential and like decisive person that they needed to be president. Uh, and that obviously angered, er, angered Burr. Uh, Burr knew Hamilton hated Jefferson. Uh, and Burr thought that he was going to win. And the fact that Hamilton swung the vote the other way made Burr extremely unhappy. Uh, and there's a couple other things Burr did as well. Uh, he made, uh, I'm sorry, a couple other things Hamilton did as well. He made Burr's father lose an election in New York. Uh, Hamilton also wrote in the papers a lot to, uh, I guess, embarrass and make fun of Burr. Um, and eventually Burr challenged Hamilton to a duel. And Burr said, if, if you don't like, take back what you said, we're going to have to fight this out. Uh, and they, you know, Burr was given, I'm sorry, Hamilton was given the opportunity to take it back. And Hamilton said, well, I didn't lie, so why would I take this back? Uh, so they met uh, in Weehawken, New Jersey. It's right across the river from New York City. They, it's kind of uh, where Jersey City is at this point, somewhere around there. Um, and they met in a clearing. Uh, they, they were pretty much, it was them and two other people that were kind of like the ones that were watching to confirm that this had happened. Uh, as the story goes, Hamilton, uh, he changed like his gun a little bit. He like made it so his trigger was pulled too easily. And some people say he shot high on purpose, but others say that he pulled his trigger too quickly and it shot like high. Burr, on the other hand, uh, didn't really like flinch from that. Uh, he was able to level his gun quite quickly because they, uh, they, you know, they both leveled their guns at the same time and he was able to shoot Hamilton in the hip. Um, Hamilton was rowed back across New York City um, to like a hospital with like the other people. Uh, Burr kind of just took off um, and because of this, Hamilton was killed from this duel. Uh, this is probably the most famous duel in American history as it says right there. Um, it's the fact that like a, a vice president got in a duel with a general and like the, the vice president wasn't even charged. Aaron Burr would never hold political office again. Uh, it, this Burr, duels weren't really illegal per se, but it's just looked down upon that these two couldn't talk their disagreement out. And the fact that he killed a man, I mean, that, that's something that even back then they weren't accepting. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this, this is a really sad and weird story. Uh, if I can, I'm going to try to find the video for you for... Uh, the end of the play Hamilton that shows you like this scene. It's re it's a really well done scene. Um, but yeah, Burr is actually going to be the vice president from here on out. Like he has this 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 four years to be vice president, uh, and Jefferson is now president. Uh, so this is where I want you to kind of take a time out. I want you to read and answer these questions. These are the questions I want you to do next because the first big thing Jefferson got is he ha got an opportunity to buy a very large piece of land from France, and because of this. Our country changes drastically. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, $15 million for 827,000 square miles is amazing. And after he bought this, he sends in his couple men to check out what they bought. So if you didn't do number three yet, please do it now. This will get confusing if you do number four now. Uh, I'm going to keep talking now. So pause it if you have to. I think that's easier. Just come back to it tomorrow or something like that. Um, but yeah, Jefferson bought this territory for, um, again, $15 million, and he realized, like, okay, I bought this. What is it? What did I get? 
Uh, so he, oh, and there, here's just a ge geographical map of uh, what he bought. So you can kind of see the green territory in the middle, uh, and you actually can kind of see the interesting part of all those white caps right on the, the left side. You, you hopefully know it's the Rocky Mountains. And uh, they knew they were there, but that's kind of like the barrier. They don't really know what's up here. And the idea is, okay, let's figure out what's there, and we can figure out if we really were just ripped off or if this is worth our time. So um, Jefferson chooses um, Meriwether Lewis, who in turn then chooses, chooses William Clark. Meriwether Lewis was like an aide to Jefferson. Uh, they, were, they both actually served in the, in the Revolutionary War, uh, not with Jefferson, but from in Virginia. Um, and they're, you know, they're both like outdoorsmen. Um, Lewis was more of a map maker. Clark was more of like a, a, a wilderness explorer in a sense. So these were two men that, that were not afraid to like, you know, get into the mud for, per se. Uh, and they were pretty comfortable with like, you know, moving and understanding trails and rivers and things of that nature. Um, so they have three goals for this expedition. This is number two. The first one, uh, scientific. They want to study plants, animals, geography. Um, economically, is this profitable? They just spent $15 million on this land. Now, that doesn't sound like too much money, but back then, that's a fortune. That's almost a billion dollars in today's money. Um, more importantly, they're hoping that there's a passage to the Pacific Ocean. And they know the Pacific Ocean's there. They're hoping they can find a waterway that goes from, the, from Missouri or, or, or like Illinois, Indiana area to uh, the Pacific Ocean. If they can find that passage, this so-called Northwest Passage, that's just a, a, a money make, maker waiting to happen. That means they can send their goods to Asia and parts of Africa faster than ever. Uh, and to them, that's, that's a lot of money. And last but not least, they want to be ambassadors to these Native American tribes. Uh, they brought these things called peace medals, uh, which you can see right here. These peace medals are actually kind of hilarious because uh, these Native Americans got these medals and they're kind of like, who is this guy? And the Lewis and Clark are like, hey, it's our president. And they're kind of like, okay, like, can we have something more valuable? Can we have guns? Can we have ammo? Can we have clothing? Things that we can't make ourselves? What are they going to do with that? Um, so it was kind of a, a lost cause with being ambassadors to Native Americans, but it was very it was a success with the scientific portion, and I'd say success with the economic portion as well. So uh, Lewis and Clark leave St. Louis in May 2000, or 2004, uh, 1804. Uh, they had two barges um, in their corpse of discovery. Uh, they had 35 to 50 men, depending on where they were. They kind of left some guys behind. They picked some guys up halfway through. Uh, but, you know, they, they had a, a sizable amount of people in their journey. Uh, and you can kind of see the journey here, too. You can see that the dark red line is their journey west, and the pinker line is their journey back east. Uh, we always talk about the journey west because going west, they didn't really know where they were going. Going east, it's kind of like, oh, we were already here. That's why you can actually see a lot of different lines going for the journey east because they have like the, they know what they found going west. They're like, hey, can we, let's try to find something different this time. Maybe a better trail going back home. Uh, oh, so this is crazy. Uh, you'd think going west through like Native American territory in the 1800s was dangerous, but the only casualty of the entire trip of, was uh, Sergeant Charles Floyd, who was like the aide to uh, Clark. Uh, he died of appendicitis. Appendicitis is like a f like a f not a freak accident, but it's like a freak illness that you really can't do much about unless you know you know like what the symptoms are, uh, and that's the only person that died from this journey. Which you know, it's, it's a little bit of a spoiler, but it's amazing that after all these trials and tribulations, they do very well, and you know they they avoid a lot of death. Uh, also, you know this is a big cause of death, of course. They were able to meet many Native American tribes along the way: uh, Lakota, Tetensu. Uh, Native Americans, a lot of like these famous tribes in South Dakota, they made a lot of friendly contact, they made some not so friendly contact, but for the most part they, they were successful of just being the high hello where Americans were just passing through. Obviously they didn't tell these Native Americans they own this territory, but they're kind of get, starting to break the tension and you know start these introductions at the very least. Uh, so the first winter in 1804, uh, Lewis and Clark spent their, uh, their winter in a Mandan, a Native American village. Uh, they understood they were not going to pass the Rockies in the, in the winter. Uh, and more all over than that, they weren't, they weren't even sure if they were going to pass the Rockies in general. Um, they were able to meet a Shosha Native American woman named Sak Sakajawea, Sakagawea, Sakagawea, however you pronounce it. Uh, we don't quite know how to pronounce it. 
um, who was from that territory, and they were able to pretty much uh, hire her and her husband to help them travel through the New World. Uh, she was 16 years old, which is crazy, um, and she had an infant son that she carried on her back through the entire journey. Uh, they credit her multiple times with saving their lives and helping out the journey exponentially, and that's why we still kind of talk about to her to this day, because Lewis and Clark were really th uh, thankful for her, and her you know, influence in, in the situation made things a lot better. That all these Native American tribes saw that they were traveling with this young Native American girl. It definitely made the journey much e easier for all of them. For example, uh, in Idaho, Lewis and Clark met the Shoshan Native Americans. It turns out Sacagawea's brother was uh, the chief of the tribe. Sacagawea was separated from him about 10 years ago, and she hasn't seen him since. So it was, it was a really emotional uh, moment that they ended up meeting up after all this time. And because of this re uh, reunion, Sakajue was able to um, get a bunch of horses for Lewis and Clark to be able to cross the, the Rocky Mountains in a much faster time. And this ends up being like a massive point. Uh, they end up running out of food in the Rocky Mountains, and if they didn't have those horses to get them down the mountains faster, there's a very good chance they would have died through their journey in the Rockies. Um, also, the Rockies, they had to do a little whitewater rafting. And you look at whitewater rafting, you think, oh, this looks fun. You know, this looks kind of cool. Um, it wasn't as much something like this. It would be more like this. And the only problem is they're going up that river, not down. So more often than not, uh, they would have to take their boats, like, put them on their shoulders and carry them up around the sides of the mountains, and then, like, furiously paddle upstream or just continue to carry it on the side. The Rockies and this, this whole area was like treacherous and, and just very painfully long for them, of course. Uh, so this is Lemhi Pass. Uh, they reached this August 1805, which is, um, I just want to point out, it took them about six months to get from South Dakota to Montana, which says a lot about the territory. Um, and when they get to Lemhi Pass, they realize that this is where the river ends. Uh, there is no river that re leads to the Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains are so high that the river does not reach the top and there's no river that goes to the other side of the mountains. This is called a continental divide. Uh, and this is what they were afraid of. Uh, they didn't quite know if they would find a river or not, and turns out that the Rockies were so high up, and, uh, and there was no way for them to kind of cut through this mountain that they had to kind of understand that they were not going to find one river going from east to west, unfortunately, for them. Uh, so once they get over the, the, the Rocky Mountains, they do meet up with a, a very peaceful tribe called ne the Nez Perche, and they were able to teach Lewis and Clark's expedition to make canoes out of logs. They would just hollow out these logs, and um, because of these canoes, they were the, the end of this journey after the Rocky Mountains was so easy. They would literally just you know, jump in the canoes, paddle downstream. If they were tired, they'd all kind of pull off to the side. They would rest for however long. They would kind of they would just it was a, it was almost a, like a nice journey at this point. And uh, they're able to speed down the Snake and Columbia River, which are two rivers that separate Oregon and Washington. If you know that line, uh, like north of Oregon, south of Washington, that's the Snake and Columbia River. So they travel that whole territory in less than two weeks. They see Mount Hood. They knew about Mount Hood already because this is a massive uh, you know, skyscraper of a mountain, obviously, that they saw from the Pacific Ocean before this. So when they saw Mount Hood, they knew they were miles away. And November 1805, Lewis and Clark's expedition made it to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, they would stay here for the winter. They would make camp in Oregon. It was a pretty miserable winter, honestly. Uh, they had a lot of rain, a lot of snow. But they were safe. Uh, they were doing a lot of like hunting, a lot of uh, journal entries. Uh, Lewis especially did a, had a lot of entries that allowed us to see like what their day-to-day -day life was. Um, and you know, pretty much all they did over the winter is just prepare to go back in the spring. Uh, as I mentioned, the blue line is their, their journey back in the spring. Lewis and Clark decide to split up for the part of the journey just to see if they can find a more efficient route. Uh, there's just one of the routes, unfortunately, that Lewis found that was going north in now Canada. Uh, additionally, July 1806, this is the only battle of the expedition. Two Blackfeet warriors were killed uh, when they were like ambushed Lewis's uh, party in what is now like Canada. Uh, nothing, it was more of a misunderstanding that the, the, the Blackfeet were 
they thought that they were like their horses that the Lewis and Clark's expedition had. They thought that they were stolen. Uh, they tried to take the horses from Lewis and Lewis's expedition, and then Lewis's men shot at the Blackfeet warriors, and they were forced to retreat out of this territory very, very, very fast. Um, August 1806, Sacagawea says her goodbyes. Um, she wasn't really going to move back to America. Like she wasn't going back to like Missouri. They, they were living out there, like being trappers. Her and her husband. Um, from what we know of her, she did did not make it past the age of 22, somewhere around there. We weren't quite sure how old she was in the first place. Uh, we were not quite sure how old she was when she died. But again, her her expertise and opinion was invaluable in this situation. And last but not least, oops, sorry, last but not least, uh, Lewis and Clark arrived back in St. Louis on September 23rd, 1806. Who are here is welcome. Um, it was more just like a, oh my gosh, they actually made it. Uh, it was such a amazing moment that like the, they saw this like ragtag group of guys on like the same boat they left coming back down the river and like everyone lost their minds they're like wow like they thought they they wrote them off for dead a year ago uh and the fact they all came back and they all had stories and animals and all these different things to kind of talk about it gave people hope that this new land is worth it and arguably to this day i think we can all agree that it is worth it uh, so it's a really cool story. There's, there's a bunch of cool videos I, I want you guys to be able to watch about this. Um, there is there's a lot for you to do, but that's something for you to do next week. Uh, so again, uh, I hope you have all four of these done. But you know, Obviously, I apologize if I go too fast sometimes on these videos. I can never tell. Um, but if you have all this done, you have a great weekend. Because uh, this is all I want you to do for the rest of the week. Yeah, that's about it. Please let me know if you need anything. Uh, oh, and I apologize if my video is cutting off stuff in the corner. I can never tell either way. I try to make it as best as possible. Sorry. Thanks, guys. Uh, talk to you soon.